This video is going to be about the Afterburner card by the Apple Corporation. What you'll probably notice is those CPU cores, they are just chilling, doing nothing. That's all going to Afterburner. We get a little bit of movement on the Vega 2 again. We are down one, so I know a lot of people kind of knocked the base Mac Pro, and why would you pick that up over a base iMac Pro? But one, you do have the option to expand that beef it up a little over time. And I think just the afterburner alone might be the reason why you'd go with a Mac Pro. Imagine if Apple wrote drivers for the Windows operating system and you put the afterburner card in a $2,800 workstation from Dell or HP. Real quickly before we jump into mind-blowing territory, I wanna quickly talk on the MPX module. Again, this is the Vega 2. It's a little different than your traditional video card though. Usually, you'd see a heatsink, a fan, but with this, it is just one giant heatsink and no fan at all. You forgot to mention the fact that it takes up four PCI Express slots. It's really not that powerful when you consider how big it is. Another thing that's exclusive to the Mac Pro is the Afterburner card, which boosts video editing performance when working with ProRes, which is the industry standard professional codec for editing video. That statement is incorrect. There's a lot of people editing Red One Raw codec, Blackmagic Design Raw, RE Raw files, as well as H.264. We tested it out with our $13,000 Mac Pro, and during playback of 8K ProRes footage, we noticed that CPU usage went from around 70% down to 2%, meaning that the Afterburner card was taking care of the workload. You know what would also help take care of the workload for that CPU? Getting dualsy on CPUs. Instead of using just one 12-core CPU, imagine if you had dual 16-core CPUs. I don't know if the Apple Corporation decided not to offer dual CPU configurations with the 2019 Mac Pro in hopes that they would sell the Afterburner cards. I consider the Afterburner card to be an obsolete product even before it hit the market. The reason being is back in 2003, you had a lot of manufacturers making real-time video capture cards. Back in 2003, most people seen video on TV, whether it was VHS, over the network broadcast, or a DVD. People weren't watching video on their cell phones back in 2003, obviously. You needed these cards to output to broadcast compliant hardware. You really couldn't just look at your computer screen. You needed to know what it would look like playing back on somebody's TV in their living room. You also needed the real-time acceleration because you wouldn't want to watch VHS tapes, Hi8 tapes, or even three-quarter inch and beta cam tapes at half resolution on broadcast compliant hardware. Instead of spending $1,400 on a computer and then spending an additional $1,200 on a video capture card, you could simply spend $2,400 on a dual Xeon workstation. You could still preview your editing on broadcast compliant hardware using Sony Vegas and Premiere Pro by using an inexpensive $150 DV converter. The DV converters did not offer any type of real-time acceleration during playback. Your real-time performance depended entirely on your computer system. Having two CPUs wouldn't just improve your video editing, it would also improve 3D animation, graphic design, audio editing, pretty much anything you were using the computer for would be enhanced by having dual Xeon CPUs. I know some people are going to say the DV converters work just fine for standard definition, but what about high definition? Video capture cards that offered real-time acceleration for high definition became a thing of the past as well. Matrox got rid of their Axio systems and replaced them with the MXO systems, which were just basically I.O. devices. There wasn't a processor on there to help out with special effects. In the year 2003, we could understand people buying a Targa 3000 capture card with real-time acceleration or even buying the Matrox Axio system. But by the time 2006 came around and we had quad-core CPUs on the market, it didn't make any sense. The real-time performance of the quad-core CPU could outperform the real-time effects processor in those real-time capture cards. And if you really wanted to boost your performance, you could get dual quad-core systems. 
it'd be better to get a dual quad core system than to invest $1,400 or even $3,000 into some of these high-end real-time video capture cards. Another reason that led to them going to the waste side is because high definition looks pretty decent at half resolution, whether it's an HDV cam or what's coming from a Panasonic P2 camera. Everybody that used Sony Vegas or even Premiere Pro could switch down to half resolution and use a product from Blackmagic Design or AJA and output to a high definition TV and still see a decent image. That wasn't the same when people were editing standard definition using VHS tapes, Hi8 tapes, and even Betacam tapes. So that's the main reason why those real-time acceleration cards became a thing of the past. In 2010, people were buying products from Matrox, AJA, and Blackmagic Design, but they were only buying them as in-and-out devices. They weren't buying them for real-time acceleration. As you can tell, I have playback at full resolution. This is a 4K sequence. I'm playing back Apple ProRes. You're gonna see me playing back several layers in real time. The CPU will get pegged at 100% at times, where the GPUs never gets past 50%. I have an eight core CPU and an RTX 2070. You can imagine if I had an RTX 2080 Ti and a 32 core CPU from AMD, I could probably play a couple layers of Apple ProRes at full 8K. I don't doubt there's Apple computers that can edit ProRes at full 8K without the need for an afterburner card. As you folks can tell, I've got the same sequence at half resolution. You're gonna notice the image quality looks fine. I can play more video layers, obviously, if I drop down to half resolution. And the same can be said about 8K. If you drop 8K down to half resolution or quarter resolution, you'll still have a nice crisp clean image to look at. Unless you're outputting to an 8K monitor, there's no reason to play back 8K video at full resolution. You could drop it down to half resolution or even quarter resolution. You also have to consider how many people have an 8K monitor or an 8K TV. If you're doing a show that's gonna be broadcast over DirecTV, and DirecTV says we don't broadcast in 8K, but we do broadcast in 4K, you'd be better off putting the 8K timeline at half resolution and outputting to a 4K monitor and letting the client know this is what it will look like when it's broadcast into most people's living rooms. Spending $2,000 on a piece of hardware that is only going to help playback the Apple ProRes codec when using Final Cut Pro 10 does not seem like a wise investment. As I stated, there's probably already systems out there that can play Apple ProRes at full 8K. I think it'd be better to spend more money on your CPU because it'll help enhance 3D animation, audio editing, as well as graphic design instead of being limited to just one application and one particular video codec. 